Hello everyone, welcome to this week's episode of The Good Guy Drinks Whiskey. Tonight's guest is Holly from Her Whiskey Love and First Fill Spirits. Holly has an extensive history in the whiskey industry, uh, working at distilleries abroad and formerly the brand ambassador of Bacardi Single Malts. More recently, she co-founded the liquor store in Saratoga Springs, New York called First Fill Spirits, which also has an Instagram handle of the same name. So with that, let me invite holly on to this live stream how you okay. doing how are you doing tonight <laughs> good how are you i'm doing well thank you um again uh, i appreciate the uh the samples you sent to me um for everybody uh holly sent me five different samples three blind two from tasmania and we'll we'll touch on all of those uh in just a second but before we get into that uh i think uh just curious how did you start in your whiskey journey like where did it kind of kick off <laughs> the whiskey journey and actually i see whiskey traveling just joined like a true true creeper he's my business <laughs> partner for the shop behind me get back to kentucky he's in kentucky right now um <laughs> Um, of course, he would join. But um, whiskey journey, uh, I guess it's still going and changing daily and <laughs> by the minute, probably for you as well. Um, scotch was my first true love. Um, I, I loved peated scotch and the corporate world that I was in before whiskey, we celebrated. I was, you know, quite young. I mean, I was legal, but we celebrated a big sale or a, a big project with a glass of Lagavulin in 16 yeah. because that's what my boss <laughs> liked to drink. So it was kind of pushed into my hand and um, and I said, oh, nothing in the world smells like that, at least here in North America that I yeah. had smelled in, in my Northeastern life. And so um, I loved the smell and it, it became a business tool for me and grew into a, a passion Mm -hmm. and a hobby and just you know how it goes you start your friends start to get annoyed with you your i guess normal friends your non-whiskey friends and you try and convert them and uh it slowly but surely becomes much more yeah no without a doubt and did you like the lagavulin when you first sipped it like you took your first sip was it like instant like oh this this is something i love you know i uh I don't really recall if I loved it or hated it. I obviously was okay with it because I yeah. kept ordering it, you know, many times after. Um, I must say that uh, maybe college helped a little bit, but uh, I have always had a pretty high tolerance and I'm pretty good at tolerating alcohol. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's a gift or or a curse. Uh, maybe it's my uh, college sports days, but I um I probably was like, wow, this is really robust and aggressive and and I can hang with it because um, yeah. I still tend to like, um, you know, I like more delicate and floral as well now, but uh, I tend to like big, bold uh, style whiskeys. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, and it's, it's always fun just kind of exploring and finding out how different each whiskey can be and, and the the journey is you know it's a lifelong journey like you said it's, it's something that always you always find something new yeah well in spring bank your shirt and your yeah. background uh you're obviously a big fan of funk robust and yes. a little slap in the face <laughs> with, with yeah. Bongos and yeah yeah i mean for me uh spring bank is definitely my my favorite uh whiskey i wish i, I could say it was my go-to but it it's a scarce resource these days so you know uh but i you know like you i like all styles of whiskey um which i guess brings us to our the samples you sent me now would you like to start with the blind ones or the tasmanian whiskeys which one would you prefer so I guess I should start by saying I knew you were a Springbank fan. Um, yeah. And Tim, I feel like we've been in the same whiskey world for quite some time, especially with all of my time in New York City. And yeah. um, But I don't think that we've ever met in person. No, actually, that's not true. The, <laughs> where I uh, first met you, and that's where we oh, exchanged okay. our... Uh, our Instagram handles was uh, you were doing a tasting in New York City for uh, I guess Bacardi. You had Deveron, okay. Aberfeldy, and Royal Brackla, and uh, it was just some Adventure you know Club. core range. Yeah, uh, yes, Adventure Club. Yes. And I went down with my brother, a few of my friends, and we uh, that was that was the first time I met you. But I'm sure you met a lot of people during those uh, tasting days. So at I don't. The church. Yes, <laughs> at the church. 
So that was, uh, and that was a few a couple of years ago, uh, at least. Oh, I apologize, but now I remember it clearly. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so that was our first interaction in, uh, you know, in, but since then, I this is our first time talking since then, at least uh, through video chat. All right, all right. Mm -hmm. Well, my bad. But anyways, no worries. Either way, where I feel like we've still been uh, for many, many years, at least on Instagram, been Instagram friends. I'm always oh, yeah. liking your posts and. Um, so I, uh, I decided for fun, I would just send, um, kind of a mix of things. Oh, there's three that I sent you. There's actually five in total. Uh, yep. like we had discussed the three that are blind, just say one, two, three. Yep. And I'll give you this. One is, uh, a store pick for the okay. shop. Got the one right here. Not number one, just one of them. Oh, one of them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so one of them, um, <laughs> Another one is uh, the other two are single malts. Okay. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. All right. All right. Uh, well, I guess, uh, you know, I'll have some questions for you as we taste through these whiskeys. But uh, are you tasting one of the ones you sent me right now? I am. All right. Do you, is this one of the blind samples or? It is. All right. <laughs> which, uh, which number are you with right now? Just so I can pick up the same number. I'm on, I had to write it down too, because when you do blind, you have to make sure you write down your own blind yes, lineup. You do. Um, oh, I'm on number one. All right, perfect. So I will grab number one here. I've already got it poured okay. out. I guess I sort of already alluded to the fact that one of them is not a single malt, because yeah. I said two of them are single malt, so mm -hmm. you can already start to narrow it down. But yeah, And then one, one is, so two are available in the shop. One's not mm -hmm. a single malt, one is a single malt, and one is not, um, it's not available in the shop. Okay, all right. So, so. It's just some that I've enjoyed drink, drinking right now. Um, some will bring up some nice old memories, maybe, okay. for you too. We'll yeah. see. <laughs> all right, all right. No pressure. No. I've got my wee Glen Cairn. I have a, a great friend, John and Lori, out of Boston. I've never had a Glen Cairn with my name on it, I realized, no, after cool. all these years. Not to be spoiled rotten, but they made me one with my name, and I'm obsessed with it. So thanks, John and Lori in Boston. Just be very careful when you wash it. You don't want to break it. These yes, aren't these aren't the most sturdy, sturdy glasses. We like well, cast strength at the shop, too, but you probably knew that. <laughs> of course. I mean... For me, and I, for for most whiskey enthusiasts, cast strength just uh, allows you so much more flexibility and freedom in the way you drink it, because you can always dilute it down, but you have that opportunity that that uh, freedom to kind of adjust the water levels and really extend the life of a bottle of whiskey. It's interesting though, because you know I worked in retail as the first my first gig in whiskey, yeah. and I guess I recall it then, but you know we had. A lot of a lot of core range items mm -hmm. in that role, you know, alongside a lot of great single cast, single barrel cast strength. Yeah. So it's a a good mix. And here at First Fill, um, it's we do have things that we're not anti 40, 43, 46, you know, yeah. bottled and bond fifty, but it just tends to be, you know, we bring in what we like to drink and it's a lot of cast strength across yeah. the board from you know, bourbon, rye, scotch, new world. Japanese is harder to find gas strength, but we have it. And a lot of people are still, you know, we forget in our whiskey bubble that uh, cast strength is intimidating. Oh, you know, yeah. it can, uh, I've scared a few people and I quickly had to come to their aid with, um, with water and, you know, really help explain, um, you know, what natural cast strength is. And so it, it is humbling too that, it's not normal to start out at cast strength, I guess is what I'm saying. No. We, we've evolved. Yeah, I mean, if you get a new whiskey drinker into your shop, uh, the last thing you probably want to give them is some 60% 60, 60 ABV whiskey and say, all right, try this. Let me know what you think. We try. We try. Yeah. And some do okay. And some, we, you know, we say, that's all right. You know, we've got lots of places to go from here. You just have to be very gentle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Uh, you know, and I guess it, if some people it might just click with them and, you know, I always, uh, for new whiskey drinkers, I always tell them, uh, you know, there's an approach to drinking whiskey that most people don't really 
you know, know about. You know, you'll take a sip, you'll swallow it, and it'll blow up your sinuses, and you're not going to like it. But if you approach it in a certain way, you know, you're more uh, deliberate and gentle in your sips uh, without letting that alcohol vapors kind of throw you off. You can really start uh, enjoying some of those cast characteristics and the the whiskey outside of the alcohol burn. Yeah. Um, so, uh, do you, so do you have any core range whiskey in first fill spirits or is it just unique bottles? Uh, I wish I, I guess I probably could, but I, all my cords would get messed up. Um, <laughs> you can see, a, actually you can see a little bit of the scotch section. It's a yes. little ways away, but it is actually the biggest section in the store. Go figure. Who would have thought, yeah. um, the scotch drinker carries a lot of scotch. Um, but we have whiskey from all over the world. Um, and we're not anti-core. Charles, who's whiskey traveling, who is on here, he's my business partner in the shop. And one of the reasons that we knew we'd be able to make this store work is that we approach whiskey in the same way. And that the big, and I've worked for the big brands, you know, um, yeah. the big brands are great for a reason. They make and blend great whiskey and they obviously have great marketing budgets. And there's a reason why they're number one, number two, and and mainstream and on every liquor store shelf, but they have a home um, yeah. and they, they are going to be okay in those homes that they have in the, you know, the massive uh, sorts of chains and outlets and everyday liquor store. And I'm kind of leaving off bars and restaurants, just retail life. Yeah. Um, and just from our travels, we knew how many brands were just getting lost and dying on the shelf. I mean, mm -hmm. especially in American whiskey, um, you know, IBs as well, independent bottlers and Scotch whiskey, it can happen for sure. Uh, but in American whiskey, there's some fantastic things happening in Colorado and all over the country. Um, and we wanted to be able to showcase those. And mm -hmm. so we do have some, you know, we have Old Forester 1920, just a staple, um, yeah. you know, for us that we just love. And, um, you know, we will get some brand names that people recognize. And I think that makes it a little bit more comforting. But yeah. we do want people to be a little in shock when they look at the shelves. And, um, you know, we have different rules depending on which state you're in, but we can sample people on things and we always have lots of different bottles open and we encourage people to, you know, this is uh, not your normal liquor store. We want you to actually yeah. spend some time here um, and find something new to go off and impress your new yeah. friends. So. You know, I know you have a pretty strong community within Saratoga Springs that, you know, that you interact with a lot. Do you have any available uh, programs or anything for people who don't live necessarily close by but want to keep that connection strong in terms of tasting what you guys are tasting and, and kind of interacting that way? Well, definitely come to Saratoga Springs. Uh, it's it's not a shabby place. I was not familiar with it until I met Charles and actually came up here to do a seminar with his Saratoga Whiskey Club. And I thought, oh, this could this is a pleasant place. It's mm -hmm. uh, And it's kind of the gateway to the Adirondacks and to Massachusetts and um, and also to just, you know, it's up upstate New York. So further than you, because you're yeah. technically upstate, yeah. um, you know, unfortunately in, in spirits, we're bound a little bit by some strict rules We're yeah. we're hopeful that things will change. Um, but obviously the community is strong and, um, you know, there's lots of opportunities in a couple of States that we, you know, that we can share our whiskey with, um, so our website, we work really, really hard on. Um, again, we came at it with we're whiskey drinkers and buyers first. And mm. we know some of those pain points of seeing a really terrible website with no photos and seeing things and knowing in your gut that it's not there, but yeah. getting your hopes up and having to call and speaking to someone that doesn't know what you're talking about. And, you know, we've all dealt with the hunt can be fun, but it can also be really painful. Um, oh, yeah. You know, you're, this might not be your full-time job hunting down some of these bottles. So we work really hard on tasting notes, um, you know, information on the website. So even just for education, every bottle is almost a mini blog post, you mm -hmm. know, helping you to understand the, the distillery, um, you know, where it's located, the mash bill, you know, finishing, terms that are in there, flavor profiles that you might expect from that. And we try to have brand tasting notes and our tasting notes included. So we, we try and personalize it. And if you get to the shop and you meet Charles and I, you'll learn our palettes too. So 
if you know that I always get chocolate out of, you know, certain toasted finishes or double oaked and you don't, then you know to just disregard it when you see yeah. all these tasty you know, for you know, people start to to learn uh learn our style and we learn our customers too, which I think is the most fun. Um so that's that's how we I wish I could say we could just ship to you and we'll come see you and, and drink together, but it's not the way yet. <laughs> yeah, not yet, unfortunately. No, but that is really cool. And I, I do like the transparency on your, your website. It is uh, one of the better websites that I've been on and kind of scrolled through. And your selection is wonderful, too. I mean, you have tons of unique bottles, tons of uh, variety, not just scotch whiskeys, but bourbons and uh, world whiskeys in general. So uh, it, it is a great, uh, a great start. And, you know... Coming from being surrounded by whiskey enthusiasts, you know, um, there's always a drive and an interest of the people you communicate with. Uh, how was uh, there? Was there any change in like uh, perspective when you open your shop, going from like, all right, we're we, we're surrounded by people that love whiskey, and then you open a shop to everybody? Is that do you find any kind of uh, uh, challenges with getting the word out there and, and getting people to know how great whiskey can be? Yeah, it's definitely, uh, I think it's important to also step outside, I guess, onto the street and talk to normal people because mm -hmm. you realize that, you know, people talk about this whiskey bubble and, oh, it's, it's going to burst and, uh, you know, there's not, there's going to be too much whiskey and it's going to be, you know, lakes and lakes of whiskey, like the seventies and eighties and, mm -hmm. and nineties. And I just don't think so. I mean, we, we get new customers in all the time um, yeah. and it's, it's really encouraging. And we get a lot of people that have started to call us. They're learning that when they call, they actually will get someone that they can speak to on the other line um, emails as well. Yeah. You know, and people are, it, there's a lot of people that haven't even scratched the surface. They just know they like old fashions, but they don't know why, mm -hmm. you know, or they just know that they had a great Manhattan and they don't understand why. And so, I just think we're getting started and I, I love starting with newbies and seeing that journey. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, we're all newbies to a certain degree, you know, a lot of this new world stuff, I'm, you know, all bushy eyed, like, Oh, wow. Like I've never tasted stuff like that. And, you know, I feel like sometimes too, like, wow, I have so much more to learn. Yeah. I am not even there yet. Um, oh, yeah. so it's, I think it's humbling. Um, because sometimes we, just all talk to each other and especially working for the big brands. You know, I was very lucky. I got to go to some of the best bars and restaurants in the country, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes the world and talk to very knowledgeable spirits and whiskey folks. And, uh, and that's not, not real life. It was amazing. And I learned a lot from it, but um, I guess I like talking to the common folk too and getting them excited about, you know, their first, uh, you know, 50 plus dollar bottle. Yeah. You know. Oh yeah, absolutely. So. I mean, and it's part of my platform. The whole reason I wanted to start it in the begin first place, and this was about three years ago, was to try to reach people who don't necessarily know whiskey and how it can be, how great it can be, um, and uh, not necessarily. And I, you know, I love interacting with the other enthusiasts out there and the friendships that you develop over the years. Um, but uh, it is always fun, you know, when you go to like a wedding or a party and you have whiskey curious people, you at least have to have them to be slightly curious in whiskey and how you can kind of dive down that road with them. And they are just kind of blown away by how whiskey really is compared to what their thoughts were on it and their perceptions and how that completely shifts once you really appreciate it and approach it in the right way. Um, so oh, I, I, always, yeah. I always find that pretty fun. Yeah, it's a, uh, I mean, people want to know what they're drinking and eating and they want to be able to a understand it and b talk about it, yeah. you know, be able to, I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, I think people really care about what they're spending their money on and, mm -hmm. and they want to be able to explain it to people and explain it to themselves of why they like it. And, you know, it's, that's been happening for, for decades now, more questions around, yeah you know, what we're actually putting, putting in our bodies. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's great. And yeah, it's, it's fun to see that light bulb go off yeah. and, and people get really pumped about it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely. Um, all right. So I have more questions about your background, but first let's jump into the back to this first whiskey. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, just my general takeaway is I, I do enjoy it. Uh, it's clearly cast strength. If I had to guess, it's probably approaching 60 ish, 60 ish percent ABV, oh. but 
I this is my first pour of the night, so my palate really hasn't been acclimated, so it might not be quite that high. Seven o'clock on Thursday, it's your first pour. It's my first pour, yeah. Usually I like to drink something, something light, like a, you know, a 40 or 43% ABV just to kind of uh, acclimate. Oh, whoops. But I, I didn't, I didn't uh, get Not around. with her whiskey, love. <laughs> no, not, not tonight. Um, uh, I, I mean, it tastes like it's probably some sort of uh, refill sherry bud or sherry cask matured. And it reminds me a little bit of like a Glendronic cast strength. So that's kind of my takeaway from this one. But I do enjoy it. It's a nice, it's a nice initial pour. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I actually, I love um, seeing the shock on people's faces when they come in right when we open at noon. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we'll be talking and I'll say, well, I have it open. Do you want to try? I say, it's not your, it can't be your first whiskey of the day. <laughs> like it's, it's noon. It's 1230. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, do you have to go back to work or like what's yeah, the deal? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. like I'm at work. So it's, it's probably yeah. not my first whiskey of the day. So. No, no, and it's part of your job. It's expected to drink whiskey throughout the day. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so do you want me to reveal whiskey yes. number one? Let's find out All what right. whiskey number one was. So this is Del Bach. Oh, interesting. Um, an American single malt. I've been okay. loving their stuff. Um, I should probably reverse the camera. See if... No, uh, it's just no, going to go. No don't reverse it. Like you. Yeah. It's says, don't what's reverse. Up, what's, whatever's on the other side of your phone, that's what we'll, what we'll <laughs> which is nothing. All yeah. right, so um, yep, American single malt, spot on with ABV, sixty percent. Um, this is uh, obviously a ton of oak influence, but in in a sherry way, like in a right. fortified way. I get this very sort of like burnt chocolate orange. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just it's sticky but silky at the same time. Um, we tried this at a dinner recently, and I wasn't super familiar with Del Bach, but this is one of the ninth floor uh, single barrel releases that uh, the distributor does, um, Skernick, and they always usually have good picks. Yeah. And I tried it, and it was my favorite of the night. I mean, we had Canadian on the table, um, you know, we had scotch, and I just was, I just was enamored by it. I mean, it was yeah. so explosive with this orange berry chocolate. Um, it was a way to get a fortified wine without using fortified wine. So I thought yeah. it was a, a nice treat. Yeah, no, that that's a really nice one. And wh where is this distillery for? So this one, I always get it mixed up. Is it New Mexico or Arizona? Look, I should probably should have. Arizona. All yeah, right, so Arizona. Uh, we do have some, uh, some whiskey from New Mexico. So this is from um, Arizona and it's their um, distillation. Uh, okay. Single American single malt typically sometimes is, but typically isn't sourced. Um, yes. So this is uh, their own stuff. And now we, once I fell in love with this, we brought in a bunch of Del Bach. So now we've got yeah. a whole Amer uh, North American, Canadian included, North American uh, whiskey section, single malts. Yeah. And I'm guessing this is a pretty young whiskey for the most part too, right? It's probably no, no more than a few years, three, three to five years old, something like that. Yeah, it's a couple of years old. It's a smaller barrel too. All so, right. Yeah, um, it tastes much older than it actually is. I mean, I would have guessed like a seven to eight year old single malt scotch if I if I didn't know. So that that's really nice. I'm surprised. Uh, I haven't had a ton of uh, American single malts in my life, so um, you know it's fun to do these blind because you're not going in with any prejudices or anything. You just see if you like the whiskey or not. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. I um, especially for American single malt, and they're gonna have this. It's a good fight because it's a good comparison, but. They're always going to have to make sure people know to step away from scotch when, yeah. when going into it because it should be different it, just because it's the same grain and it should be different. Yeah. And same with actually like a lot of these Colorado whiskeys and Texas and you know, as we get to other states for bourbon and such, you have to remove yourself from Kentucky and Indiana because it's it should be different. It should be uh, a familiar cousin, yeah. <laughs> but it should be it should be different. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge with American single malts in general is the uh, the price points have to be higher to build in the production cost of making the whiskey. Uh, and then it's competing with much older uh, and more well-known sure. scotch whiskeys. So it's, it, it, it's going to be tough for them to kind of break down that wall and provide something unique and interesting in that way. Yeah, no, I agree. There's a uh... There's always a fight to be had. It was yeah. non-age statements for Scotch for a long time. It was yeah. yeah there's always always a fight. Yeah, like uh, for example, the Virginia Distillery Company they make pretty good American single malt whiskey. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but they're a price for a bottles around seventy dollars, and for seventy dollars you can get a whole uh, range of really high, well-made Scotch whiskeys that are you know higher ABVs or older age statements. Obviously, the aging process is different depending on the climate, but um, at least to the general consumer, they're not going to really know the difference, and they're going to be like, well, why would I get this American single malt from the Virginia Distillery Company when I can grab a uh, you know, whatever I'm familiar with from Scotland. So, um, it is going to be, that, that is going to be a challenge for them to, to try to figure that, that market out. Yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful. Mm. We're, uh, we're building a little section around it. I think there's, uh, again, it's, uh, it's kind of new world in its own right, you know, yeah. rest of the world. And, um, I think the experimentation will be there, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're in the early adoption phase. Yeah. So, yeah, and if uh, if they can continue to make single malts like this, then they're uh, they're in a good place because that's a really nice whiskey, and uh, you know I think it just needs to take some time for people to buy in on it. Have you tried uh, or have you been to the Ten Mile Distillery uh, in upstate yes. New York? That that that's a really yeah. really cool place. I'm really excited to see what kind of stuff that they uh, they come out with in the next uh, couple of years. Yeah, they um, uh, Charles and I were down there last fall. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, talk about when you can't when you couldn't travel to Scotland, just go to Ten Mile yeah. <laughs> in, in the Hudson Valley. I mean, I was like, wow. Um, I actually felt, you know, obviously for um, for Scythe, you know, all looked like a total small distill, not small, but like Nakdu, you know, like a smaller oh, yeah. distillery set up in Scotland, um, Scottish uh, master distiller. I mean, it was yeah. like stepping uh, over the Atlantic Ocean, but they're. They're making some some great whiskey. Um, you know, we tried it. You probably did too. Tried it quite young, but um, yeah, we're uh, we're excited to to know them and see and follow along with them. Yeah, yeah, same here. I uh, was able to go down there too. I met uh, uh, Shane Frazier, I think, uh, is the master distiller. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, he basically said that we're just taking all Scottish ideologies and bringing them to here, and it's basically Scotch whiskey in for American single malt. Uh, so that that's pretty interesting to see. And I think their official whiskey will be this winter. I think it's finally three years old for their initial. Oh, uh, it's already time. Um, so yeah, huh. the, and uh, I know I'm on the list for one of their first bottles. So I'll be definitely going up there again to try out what the whiskey actually tastes like once it's official. Um, so I'm nice. looking forward to that. Um, all right, so let's jump into this next pour here. Uh, I mystery dram number two. Um, let's see what was on the list. Right. I'm going to keep drinking the Delbach. I'm not done yet. All right. Now, yeah, I only did half the vial, so I'm a little bit uh, lower. I mean, just on the nose, if I had to guess, I would say this is not the uh, the single malt. Yes, I knew that this might be a little bit of a curveball, but you'll, you'll probably know the name. I'm sure okay. you'll know the name. Um, so it is our Nulu Toasted Rye, okay. um, which is a pretty big name now, sourced from MGP. Um, I just, I really love this whiskey because mm-hmm. it's, for me, it's a bit of a roller coaster and on the palate. And that's, for me, that's a lot of times, you know, sometimes we get access. We're very fortunate to lots of good whiskeys. And I want explosive on the palate and not alcohol explosive, but you know, lots of, uh, lots of flavor. And this is their rye. So 95 yeah. rye, 5% malted barley is the mash mm-hmm. bill for that yeah. classic Indiana rye. Um, it's almost six years old. It's 58% ABV. Oh, really? Wow. Um, that's all. It's like your pet. And usually people drinking rye find it a little bit hotter yeah. Um, yeah. compared to single malt. Yeah, for my, at least maybe you're right, maybe my, the 60% before that really kind of cooled things down for me. But um, for me, it, it drank a lot cooler than 58%. That's actually pretty surprising. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I don't have a ton of history drinking rise. I've got a few on my shelf, um, but I rarely reach for them just because I just prefer scotch in general. Um, but this one, it seems like it's not quite as fiery as some of the other ryes, but it's got a lot of flavor to it. It's kind of more nuanced, and I, I really enjoy that. That's a really nice rye whiskey. I, it might be um, what softened it a bit is that toasted barrel. And I know it's yeah. very popular in bourbon and American whiskey, rye included right now. Um, and it was Charles picked this single barrel for the shop sometimes. Now we can't do anything together as friends because <laughs> someone has to run the shop. But um, he was in uh, Nulu's a part of Louisville. And um, 
he called me in, in a tizzy. I wonder if he's still watching. And he was like, I'm here to pick a rye. And this one tastes like bourbon. Mm. He was mm-hmm. like, I think that they're tricking me. Like, this yeah. is this is not a rye. It's a bourbon. But he's yeah. getting so confused. And I was like, all right, can you ask for 48 hours and bring the samples back to me? So we tried them. And uh, obviously, a toasted is just that lighter, not a char. So that longer but um, and lighter uh heat influence on the new new oak and it definitely now shows as a rye once it got bottled in yeah uh, but those original samples were very confusing it was just sweet spice sweet spice chocolate yeah. um definitely you know some of that um uh, more of grassy some people say dill you know these these yeah. sorts of rye notes spice pepper and i loved that confusion because it just mm-hmm. for me kept it was like spice, sweet, spice, sweet. And it just, it was not boring. Um, yeah. And it just kept going. And, you know, again, single barrels are fun. There's a lot of Nulu's out there now, but I just, I love the interaction with um, with the oak and the grain in this one. I think it shows well. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Uh, and by the way, Ralph is uh, saying he's more than happy to watch the shop for you if you guys ever want to. <laughs> If you guys ever want to leave it, <laughs> but uh, but no, yeah, I, I mean, just having that small half ounce sample, um, I, a lot of the stuff you're talking about, I can really understand. Um, you know, as far as rise that I've had, this is one of the better ones that I've uh, that I've drank before, and it's really really nice. It 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 opens up my mind to wanting to explore more rise, but then I look behind me and I see the hundreds of bottles of whiskey I already have, so it's like, oh man. Well, that's why I threw it in there because I was like, I was like, he's a barley bum. I was like, you can tell. <laughs> I definitely, I definitely wine. am. Yeah, I mean, I do like uh, bourbons, and I, I mean, I, I like all styles of whiskey, but I definitely skew heavily into the. You the have to place. say that. That's yeah. the diplomatic thing to say, but we get it, Tim. Yeah, it, it is the diplomatic thing to say, but I, I genuinely, there are bourbon nights that I have that I really enjoy the bourbons. For me, there's less differentiation between one bourbon to the next, um, and I think scotch tends to be a little more nuanced. There's a, a wider gamut of flavors that you can enjoy with a scotch whiskey over a bourbon, but I do enjoy my bourbon nights. Uh, when I The rare days I grab for a rise, I do enjoy it. Uh, I've got rums, I've got cognacs. I mean, I do like to keep an open mind to all types of spirits, so, you know, and it helps build out your palate, helps you learn more about whatever region the whiskey or the drink comes from so um you know i never exclude any and i'm lucky like some people they just can't tolerate like peat or something like that where it's just their palate just doesn't finds it revolting and i'm just glad i don't have any uh, biases or physiological things that <laughs> prevent me from enjoying some of this stuff um you know and another thing that i've noticed and i don't know if you can let me know if you've uh found this out too it's harder to convert a bourbon drinker into scotch than a scotch drinker into bourbon have you found that to be true in your in your history yes and you've probably also noticed that um if you want to try that hard uh not well traveled road from bourbon to scotch it happens it can yeah. it can be done um but i find you have to go to heavily sherried yeah scotch and that's not as common <laughs> anymore not- either um, and European oak, if you can, like, even if that is still an option, not American oak, it's so counterintuitive because they, yeah. I mean, obviously color deters them a little bit, but they want to go, the bourbon drinker wants to go to a bourbon mature yeah. single malt, but you tend, you get the vanilla, sure, and, and sometimes some of the caramel, but you get more citrus, you know, it's, it's usually yeah. brighter and, um, it's not that heavy weight mm-hmm. that they're used to from the corn and new chard oak. So you've got to try. And also blends that have seen sherry, yeah. which, again, is not super common. So it's it can be a little bit of a, a challenge, a tug of war at the yeah. scotch shelf. But we <laughs> we try our best. Japanese is actually harder. I mean, yeah. trying to get a bourbon drinker to go over to rice whiskey, and it's basically like you just push them down the stairs. I mean, it's, it's yes. not fun. <laughs> basically impossible. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's just because, like you said, bourbon is just so much more bold and sweet and just kind of like in your face, where a scotch is, you know, you, sometimes you have to sit back and you have to think about it for a minute and really get some of those nuances and the, the more subtle flavor profiles. Um, I had a, a Instagram live with a, a bourbon drinker, a VA bourbon hunter. With a bourbon drinker. Yeah, He's and uh, the, He's another bourbon drinker. uh, yeah, uh, Damon, his uh, his handle is VA Bourbon Hunter. I'm not sure if you know who he is, but um, 
he uh, and my the goal of the Instagram live was to try to convert a bourbon drinker into a Scotch drinker, or at least get him to appreciate it. And I I've heard that advice before, heavily sherry. But the first thing he said was, "I hate sherry." So I was like, "Oh man, some of the samples I sent you, you might not like." Um, so, uh, but the one the one Scotch he liked surprisingly was the Oban twelve year old uh, special release. Mm. So, and that's you know very light. It he described it as tasting like. Uh, corn uh frosted flakes so i was like yeah it's actually kind of true it does taste a little bit like frosted flakes so um but yeah he was he was the opposite of that so that, that added that additional layer of challenging because sherry was out for him and i you know i'm kind of painting a very simple box i mean that's my my gut instinct yeah. is to lead them to that but actually just today um you know it could just be a robust to robust thing you know someone yeah. that likes cast strength bourbon we were talking bourbon for like 20, 30 minutes. And then he was like, well, today though, I'm actually, the other thing that I like is peated scotch. Okay. Like yeah. heavily peated. And I was yeah. like, all right, that, that makes sense too. I mean, again, and he was, he was like Ardbeg 10. I mean, he was naming things that were bourbon barrel yeah. matured. So, you know, sometimes I even have to take myself out of my own, you know, bias. And, yeah. uh, but I mean, you, you can't just, uh, yeah, it can be tricky. I I'm shocked every day. We'll yeah. we'll put it that way. You would probably yeah. enjoy though some a lot of bourbon producers now are using a higher malted barley content in their mash bill. Um, Leopold Brothers, Castle and Key, um, where they're obviously using it for flavor and not yeah. just to help during fermentation now. So, um, you know, and those tend to be nuttier, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit earthier, um, not that over the top sweet so now yeah, i'm rethinking yeah. some of the samples that i sent you yeah well no no these these samples so far have been great so i, I can't claim so I, i'll jump into the third sample here now okay we're, uh, we're back to and work. i actually am due for uh i'm gonna finish this little bit of delbach and my wee glen karen mm -hmm. i'll have to hide the bottle while i pour it I'll mm -hmm. sip it yeah i I'll, I'll look away so i don't i don't actually see it so you're going to be mad at me, but I originally was, I had the bottle in my hand and the, the glass vial. Mm -hmm. I recently moved to recently just bought a new house. And yeah. so everything's boxed up, but I do everything by distillery. And so I, I moved it all. And so I found the two boxes I was thinking of. And one was, um, a spring bank cage whiskey. Mm-hmm. And, but then I was looking at your Instagram and I was like, he's drank so many of those. Like, why don't we do something a little bit different? I know you would have loved it. <laughs> Usually Springbank is, you know, one, Charles and I will blind taste each other on our podcasts that we have um, for the shop. And Springbank is the only one that I can always guess. Well, so yeah. far I've been able to guess all the time. Yeah. And so, you know, I take pride in that. It's like we're meant to be together. Yeah. Um, we're, we're a true couple made to be, but I put it down and grabbed something else. Okay. So maybe so, now you're probably upset, but what was the, uh, the cage bottling that you had just out of curiosity? My favorites are classic spring bank bourbon matured. Okay. That, that is my dream spring bank sipper. Um, right. but I also had two hazel burn refill sherry, which are lovely. Um, and then I had, um, a spring bank refill sherry. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, yeah, no, I, the spring bank and X bourbon is just so nice because you get so much of that classic spring bank characteristic. It doesn't get buried by any of the cast makeup. And, uh, it's just, you know, those kind of those tropical, uh, fruitness that goes along with their funk and peat. It's so nice. I got the, have you ever had their, uh, uh, I think it was last year's 12 year old cast strength, which is hundred percent X bourbon. Did I? What's the color label on that? It's the red one. You can actually see it right back there. Red? Yeah. No, I think I've only had their core cast strength. Yeah, so this is their this is their core twelve year old cast strength, right? This is the one oh, that they oh, release okay. twice a year. Uh, but the if you ever see their fifty five point nine percent ABV one, that one is a hundred percent ex bourbon matured uh, cast strength. Okay. So it's uh, worth keeping an eye out for. And since you own a whiskey short store, hopefully one will come. Spring Bank's right. hard. We don't. We don't have it. I, I mean, I saw, yeah, I did see on your Instagram maybe a few months ago. You had the ten-year-old, maybe uh, that you had. We had uh, the ten, we had some of the ten, which is great. But you know, Campbelltown, it's hard to get representation. Yeah. Um, 
you know, Glen Scotia is great too. Um, it's, and some stuff is available from them. We have some Kilcarran, um, mm. which kind of gets the, gets the short end of the stick too. Um, but it's, uh, our best representation right now is the Gauldrons from Douglas Lang, mm-hmm. the blended yeah, mall, yeah, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. a bunch of Glen Scotia with a little bit of spring bank. I mean, they just, it's bank. great, but it, yeah. it's hard to represent that region right now. I know there's some new distilleries being built. Um, yeah. we, we had talked about it recently, but, um, yeah, trust me. I mean, we would carry it and I would love, I mean, long row. I mean, I love getting people out. Again, I love Isla, but I love when we get a late check or we yeah. get, you know, something else uh, that is just a little outside of the norm um, yeah. for yeah, heavily yeah. heated. Even some of the highlands, you know, like I love Glen Glassa Torfa, um, mm-hmm. you know, just to mix it up a little bit. You you don't have to drink Lafroig and Lagavulin and Ardbeg all the time. No, so. no. And I'm actually keep Lechik on the down low because that is so wonderful. I do not want those prices to... <laughs> Oh, and poor Tobermory, the regular tortilla. Yeah. <laughs> Tastes yeah. like cucumbers and weird butter. <laughs> yes, it does. It does. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the and the challenge with Springbank in general is that the uh, distribution chain, they they increase the price so much when it comes to the United States, more so than any other whiskey, I think. I mean, you buy a Springbank 10 in the UK, it's like 45 50 bucks if you try you know convert the, the pounds and in the u.s it's around a hundred dollars so it's it's the the price barrier is a, sh- a challenge and then just the limited stock that you can find and now that it, there's a the spring bank craze in society it's just a tough whiskey to find nowadays i remember um david allen who works for the brand and covers the yeah. i think he still covers north america he doesn't need to but i remember i was in chicago i forget what the show was at Benny's, but um, I went up and said hi to him and we had lunch with him and, and just at the end, I mean, this is such a jerk move too. I was working for Bacardi and I, I love the doers portfolio and I still do, but, um, I was like, Hey, if you ever need a brand ambassador for spring bank, like I know some people that would probably, oh, so yeah. many people, right. They would, he goes, Oh, he was like, that's really, of course he's so nice and humble. He was like, that's really nice. He was like, we don't really need. Uh, any more brand ambassadors because everything we send here you guys just drink it <laughs> now it's like <laughs> right to the yeah. point yes we you're correct we don't you don't really need help in selling no. your brand at the moment you're not going to increase production your brand's really hot right now like yeah. that's not the time to hire more brand ambassadors to to go and push your product so no, yeah, and they they have a, a fairly limited capacity in general, you yeah. know. But you know, we like you said, the Kilcarran's kind of under the radar right now, and that's effectively Springbank Light. I mean, they use the same barley, the same fermentation. Um, you know, they use different stills, but every the whole process is done obviously on the Springbank site. So you know, that's the uh, the hidden gem right now. That if you can find Kilcarran, that's the closest you'll probably get in general uh, to yeah. to a Springbank. Luckily, I before I I was able to get enough bottles before the, the craze over the last couple of years mm-hmm. to have a, enough to hold me over for a little Just while. Drink them slower. Drink yeah. them slower. Um, and I went to Springbank uh, about a month ago uh, and I stocked up on a, a lot of stuff when I was there too. So I, I should be okay. Oh good, you didn't need any more. <laughs> I, I always need more. I always, there, there's, no, uh, there's no such th- uh, no such thing as too much Springbank. So that's a, a that's general true. rule. Um, but this last pour, uh, I you know, I. I, it, it tastes like a Scotch whiskey, if I if I had to guess, and I think you mentioned that there was one Scotch whiskey, so my uh, limit uh, I'm limiting eliminating the uh, the other two, obviously. Yeah, um, I'll see what you think. And to, I wanted to give a shout out to Tomo, my friend Tomo from Brandy Library in Copper and Oak is on. So oh, nice. I mean, that's him calling us uh, to the city, Tim, because we don't go enough. <laughs> you know, I Copper and Oak is one of my favorite. Uh, whiskey bars i've only been there a couple of times but uh you know because when you have so much whiskey at home it's you, you uh, don't necessarily go out as often you know you, you'd rather have people come over to your house and share what you have um but uh i do need to get out to copper and oak again that it, that's such a cool little bar all right so what do you think it's actually different than i haven't had this in a while um and it's different than i remember um it tastes like it's older, if I had to guess, but I'm never great at determining uh, super old versus. Super... <laughs> and then you feel bad too when you're. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so it's like, oh, this is like three and a half years old, barely a whiskey. Um, <laughs> Just call everything old. I think it's twenty plus years old. 
good job. In them. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, lower ABV again, but maybe it's my uh, mm -hmm. my palate. You're, it is a little bit lower. All right. Than what we've had. Um, so I guess, do you want me to tell you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess this is um, me knowing that, yes, of course, we met. Um, this is one of my favorite distilleries, and I used to work for them. Um, most Springbank fans tend to like them and Mortlock and, you know, all of the, the worm tub and a little funk mm -hmm. um, distillery releases. And I'm not even sure if you're a big Krigalki fan. I feel like for some reason you liked McDuff. Am I remembering uh, that? Yeah, yeah, I did like But that. you wanted uh, it at cast strength, and I said, mm. actually, yeah. we have a cast strength McDuff from Gordon McPhail right now. So <laughs> we that's, that's, sounds like can find it. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just going to be apples, 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 all yeah. the apples. Um, so is this is, earth, I'm guessing, uh, hogshead. Hogshead. Sorry. Yeah. Um, oh, this one, you mean? Yeah. No, no, this is actually, um, uh, first fill sherry butt, 607 okay. right. bottles. Um, 19 years old, old malt cask, a bottler that I've always enjoyed. One of the things they do, some of the bottlers do this, it's at 50%, so not okay. natural cast strength, but probably pretty close, being 19 yeah. years old. Yeah. Um, you don't taste the uh, the sherry? Oh, my gosh, this is so... Because it doesn't... It's like a, a heavy, like, mm -hmm. damp leaves, like, uh, fall leaves funk for me. Yeah, and I, I didn't know if that was just the, the age on it that I was tasting, like the, the old kind yeah. of library woodiness to it, or if that was mm -hmm. the, the sherry cask. So, because um, yeah. I've had similar super old, like kind of dirty ex-bourbon casks that had that kind of like that dirt, sort of like that first one we had. Sure. That kind. Of, so I, I didn't know if that was, a, you know, an old ex-bourbon versus the first fill sherry. Obviously, first fill sherry is the... But no, this is this is a really nice whiskey too. So I, all three blind samples have been excellent. So again, thank you for sending them along. And this is so out of character for me because I actually wanted to call the shop um, Second Fill Spirits <laughs> because I tend to like refill hogsheads and yeah. ex bourbon matured single malts because yeah. I love that bright, zesty, um, citrus, uh, you know, tropical. You know, th those are all things that you get from from ex bourbon, and and I I love sherry, but I tend to go for that more that jumpier style. And here I went with all pretty pretty heavy weight uh, yeah. oak influence for you. So I don't know, maybe my style is changing. It's not good if I'm headed towards sherry. <laughs> that's not good. Oh yeah, a little that's... late. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The sherry the sherry train is uh, going strong right now, but. Um, but no, I mean, I always uh, curate my samples that I give to people based on what I think they like, what the what their experience is along their whiskey journey. So I do appreciate the the three that you gave me, three I've never had before. Um, you know, I'll be happy to if you want me to send you a sample of the twelve year old cast strength uh, expert. I'll catch you in New York City. I'll let uh, you know next time I'm headed down. You have to get out of your whiskey room sometimes. Yes, let me know next time you go down there, and uh, we'll we'll figure out uh, some some sort of yeah. meetup down in the city. Um. So that uh, so, do you want to talk about the the Fanny's May Bay uh, Tasmanian whiskeys that you have here? Sure. Yeah, I I labeled those um, yes. as not to not to shock you as a, a fun extra. Um, so one of the the shop is a year old now. Uh, so Charles, who is whiskey traveling, my good friend, him and I are the ones that founded it and. Uh, obviously, the shop itself needs to function and be a shop itself, and it's it's yeah. doing great, and we're thrilled with how year one is going, and as we move into year two, so we're not going anywhere. Um, but we um, we also have lots of other whiskey projects that we're always involved in, so it also um, was meant to be kind of a home and a base point for, for those yeah. as well. Um, so like I had mentioned, Charles does a lot of whiskey and culinary tourism, um, he does coastal Scotland trips. Uh, he's done ski whiskey in Japan trips. We were mm -hmm. working on a Tasmanian um, whiskey trip uh, before COVID had hit. I've been to the bourbon trail with him many times. So just taking like-minded folks that just want to go see it for themselves and, you know, whiskey nerds merged with new but really interested in whiskey and always just, you'll notice from the shop too, you can kind of see, but 
the whole premise is is no pretension you know we want yeah. this is supposed to be fun um this is we're not saving anyone's babies we're not doing anything of the sort <laughs> we're we're drinking whiskey and meeting new people and and that's it so we like to yeah. keep it simple um and and that's how his trips are and um, you know, he kind of wanted a, a base for that. And I was working with another friend in Massachusetts um, and importing. He's an imp a small importer, um, has some Armagnac and some French whiskey. And so, or newly some French whiskey. And so I had spent a lot of time in Tasmania. It kind of caught me off guard. A lot of some Scotland folks that I knew were like, oh, all of, uh, like a bunch of our friends are moving to Tasmania and working at distilleries. And I was like, what the heck is, this was six years ago. And I was like, what the heck is going on over there? You know, like mm -hmm. why would the Scots <laughs> be moving? I mean, I know the crown and I get it. It's all connected. And it's easier yeah. to travel. But, um, and so after I had spent a month in Japan and so I was like, well, while I'm over here, another seven hour flight, it's not really nearby. Um, yeah. And so I, did some stuff in mainland and was, you know, Star Ward and there's some great things happening on the mainland. But I got down to Tasmania and still very small, you know, we're still talking small, you know, a lot of craft distillation, but just, you know, real passion and just down to earth people mm -hmm. and um, some really great whiskey coming out of there. And a lot of it, never enough production to come to the States, let alone be exported out of Australia at all. Yeah. Um, we get Sullivan's Cove once in a while here in the States, but it's every couple of years. We had a lark for a little bit. Um, and so I got in touch with some of my friends over there and was like, look, I know you don't need to, um, but I'd mm -hmm. love to. I have a home now for for your whiskey, and I'd love to share you know, something from – it's an island. It's pretty far away for us here yeah. in, in North America. Um so uh, this, this is the first set of four casks um, that we brought over, available in Massachusetts and soon to be New York. Um, mm -hmm. Only a couple hundred bottles. Um, I, I sent you the two larger casks. Um, mm -hmm. They're 100 liter barrels. Uh, the Pinot Noir matured is um, from, uh, the Pinot Noir is from Sinapius, which is a vineyard right down the road from mm -hmm. Fanny's Bay. Um, we actually went and drank a lot of great wine last time I was there. Some yeah. really great wine. Um, all organic. Uh, I'm not a wine snob or anything, but, uh, you know, organic is a fun word. Uh, but it's true, too. They said they, yeah. they do it. Um, so this is the, the Pinot Noir. Do you have a guess on – I think you have the cards. You know ABV, but it's pretty hot. Um, uh, well, I've got the bourbon one right now that I'm sipping. And do you I, on the yeah. bourbon? Yeah. So the bourbon one, I'm, I'm not all about awards, um, you know, because – Sometimes you you don't know who the panel is, and you know it's so personal. Whiskey. Um, I don't know how you feel about um, all of the different awards, but um, yeah, yeah, I, okay. you know, and obviously you're drinking Spring Bank. You're like not really paying attention to <laughs> the awards are gold every time you drink Spring yeah. Bank. But I think it is fun for um, or good for smaller producers to 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 enter a couple of them and just see. You know, I yeah. mean, it's um, it's another very expensive opinion. Um, yeah. So the the bourbon won um, won gold at the San Francisco Spirit Awards, which you know, they haven't had a lot of Tasmanian whiskey in those awards, and we were really excited for them. I mean, it's just a it's it's a couple uh, Matthew and Jules who I actually stay with them when I go over to Tasmania yeah. now, and they've taken me in like a a daughter and. Um, you know, just attention to detail. He built his yeah. own stills, um, you know, small production, but uh, more of a hobby. I just really love um, all of the explosive flavor that he's been able to oh, yeah. showcase. Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't look at the, the label for the ABV. If I had to guess, it would be, I would say, the high 50s. Um, it does. It, yeah, the, the bourbon is sixty four. Oh wow! So yeah, it's it's uh, super yeah. spicy, but it it still is very drinkable at cast strength. Uh, I did add a little bit of water, and, and so maybe that's why it uh, feels a little left. Uh, and what is this? Is this a single malt, or is there other grains in this too? It's a single malt. Yeah, it, uh, it's yep. it's definitely a very unique single malt. If I drank this blind i would almost say there would be a little bit of rye in there too but it's it's got a I can see that. yeah it's got a very unique flavor profile the nose has a slight like sourness to it that is uh that's not unpleasant it's like a, a kind of a funky sourness but 
uh, yeah, I mean, this is really impressive uh, stuff for sure uh, that I would never have. I mean, obviously, uh, since there's so few uh, bottles in the United States, I never would have been able to try it if I didn't get some samples from you. So, again, thank you for sending these along. Yeah, of course. I mean, the the shop is is really supposed to be a home for for brands like this, not just New World, but new brands that are someone needs to speak to them and yeah. that they will get lost in the masses and the big liquor store shelves. And we want to be that home. And um, that's the whole point of it is some, always something new. And we will be able to, we're, there's no in-store tastings where someone comes and stands behind a barrel and just pours it for you. Like we appreciate that, but Charles and I will, will explain it to you, you know, yeah. and, and our friends and colleagues and, you know, the community will explain it to you. And, um, you know, we're, we want you to try it and you don't have to like it. We, we move on to the next thing. It's no one's feelings are hurt. You shouldn't love everything. That would be a little yeah. bit odd too. Yeah. So, um, that's totally fine too. You know, you just move on and then we learn and adapt. And we understand that a lot of the brands that we actually carry now will continue to grow and maybe we won't carry forever. Yeah. You know, they will have moved on to their next phase in life, <laughs> almost yeah. to say. Um, and that's okay because we'll be helping the next, uh, you know, the next round. It's not necessarily craft distilleries, like how you think of craft. It's it's blenders and it's IBs. And we're seeing American uh, whiskey independent bottlers now. And, you know, it's it's more of just this all encompassing a home for these brands that, that need to be spoken about essentially. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, did you uh, work at knock distillery or what was your experience working with them? So I, um, when I was writing her whiskey love, which started as Instagram and a blog um, yeah. and it started because I didn't, um, this was seven years ago now and I had quit my corporate job and planned this year of travel visiting distilleries because I couldn't find the right whiskey education program. Um, I had gone through the WSET, the WSET, and at that point there was no spirits track. So I was kind of got stuck in wine, you know, wine tracks that I just, that's not what I wanted. Yeah. Um, and so I left and um, it was, the plan was distilleries were open for visitors seven years ago, a lot of them, but a lot of them uh, were fairly new to accepting distilleries and, or accepting visitors. And so um, I was, my plan was just to show up and see yeah. who would talk to me and what I could learn. And I would write about it on my blog so that I had, if I don't write things down, it never happened. Yeah. It's, there's something about, I keep all of my notebooks, all my tasting notes, um, and I will remember it if it's in the book and I will yeah. know what book it's in. Um, but if not, it didn't really happen. I'm not <laughs> sure what happened. Something happened, but not that. And so I knock do, uh, which is under the, the actual brand that you would see on the bottle is a knock, um, yeah. which is a little bit tricky, but they're up in the Highlands near Aberdeen and they had just opened for tours mm -hmm. and that meant no one was going for tours. <laughs> Basically there's no visitor center yeah. Um, there's two pot stills. It is a worm tub distillery, which I would come to find that I love, um, yeah. similar to Kergalaki. And I was going around with the lovely tour guide. I forget her name at the moment. And, um, she obviously saw my notebook. I have to apologize to tour guides. I'm like, I'm not stealing trade secrets. I just will not remember, um, mm -hmm. if I don't write it down. And so I was walking through and, and, uh, and she goes, Oh, uh, that's Gordon Bruce. And she pointed someone out at the end of the tour and, you know, I was like, oh, that's cool. And she was like, that's the distillery manager. And she was like, you should sit, we should go talk to him. And I was like, okay. And so we went over and I told him and at that time I had found the IBD, the Institute for Brewing and Distilling um, out of the UK. It's much more well known now in the United States, but um, they have some, I mean, they are brewing and distilling. That's where mm -hmm. you should go if you yeah. want to study whiskey, yeah. um, especially the technical side. And so I had already um, worked out with them that I was going to um, study for my certificate in distillation um, over in Ireland um, uh, later that month. So I was telling him all of this, and he said, well, you're not going to pass if you don't actually work. He's like, have you ever made whiskey? And I was like, absolutely not. I was like, I'm not a home brewer. 
I know it from, you know, my notes and, you know, I've had visited 60 plus distilleries at that point. And he was like, well, he was like, you should take the 6 a.m. shift. He was like, you can come, come do an internship here. I remember just being like, what the heck is happening? I mean, and to this day, we're still in touch. Um, I did take that 6 a.m. shift. Yeah. That was early by the way. I mean, it was for something fun, but that was pretty rough. So and I got out around three and I would um, go and get my pickled and cheese uh, ham sandwich uh, at the, what's their grocery store? I'm forgetting now. Um, but whatever it was, uh, I got into quite a routine. So I was up there for a little over a week um, working with them. And to this day, he's like, come back anytime. I don't know if that's true. You know, new corporate ownership comes in and, yeah. um, but they really took me under their wing and, uh, it was, it really did help, um, to tie everything together of what yeah. was going on in the textbook that I was reading. Um, you know, and I also learned that that was probably not, I thought I wanted to make whiskey and that really showed me that I don't know if that's actually my strong suit. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe, maybe blending and I would still love to make it, but I don't know if, you know, that's necessarily where I'm best suited. So it was, uh, it was a really great experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, you, you like the end of it where you drink the whiskey. That's the, the, the best part of it. Uh, but no, uh, when I went to Scotland a month ago, one of the distilleries I wanted to go to was not do because I love Anak and I think they're one of the best values, at least in the UK out there. Um, and so we, I contacted them and, uh, Gordon Bruce was the one who showed us, I met with him. He showed us the whole, the whole tour is just, uh, with my group that I was traveling with, uh, and him uh and he was one of the nicest coolest guys in scotland uh the whole thing he i mean you didn't have to pay for it or anything it was just he was mm -hmm. he was just interested to talk about whiskey with people who were uh interested in it and um and he had no idea that within the the whiskey community that Anak whiskey is kind of like a a revered gem for its great value. And he's like, I had no idea that people love our whiskey that much. I'm like, yeah, I mean, like the 24 year old at like 140, 150 dollars, it's one of the best values and yeah. that you can get. Uh, and the 18 year old, everything you guys make is really wonderful. And he was like kind of blown away that the whiskey community loved Anak whiskey so much. He's like, well, and then he's like, well, maybe we should be charging more for. It. I was like, well, let's uh, pump the brakes a little bit on. On the charging more for it because that's part of the love for it but since it's owned by uh the same company that owns uh Bal blair and some mm -hmm. of these other distilleries that have taken different approaches to the market because you know three four years ago Bal blair was one of the the most talked about whiskeys among whiskey enthusiasts with yeah. uh, affordable um vintages and since they switched the age statements and really jacked up the prices i don't hear anybody talking about bell blair anymore so we're oh, the, no. the fear is that anak will eventually move into that direction where they're going to really double down on prices and and uh, make it more challenging to to value and appreciate it as much as we do today i think their um their tricky name will keep them subdued for a little while yeah. i mean it, people will learn it but they really, uh, the marketing department should maybe get a little, it's probably a totally different marketing department now. But I remember, you know, the the thought behind it was, everyone's going to get us confused with knock and do. Yeah. And I yep. said, no, they're not. <laughs> they're not going to, because there is, um, no one's drinking that. So yeah. you don't need to take it now. <laughs> yeah, while you can take the name. Um, yeah. You know, it's a, uh, and like you saw, it's a small production. It's, yeah. it's very small. Um, and I'm so glad that you got to, to meet Gordon. Um, yeah. He's just, he, he really cares about oh, yeah. his crew there, the people that he works with, um, and just the quality of, of what's coming out and the safety too, which, you know, I think, I mean, obviously they're paying attention to that, but he's uh, just so caring uh, yeah. and his very dry oh yeah 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 no yeah he was such a cool guy somebody actually i i'm tentatively 
planning an Instagram Live with him at some point in the future through the Anok marketing team. So I'll keep you posted on that so oh, you can do. so you can watch. Um, um, but he he did say that uh, they've been they've been pressured to increase production. They're up to close to two million liters a year, most of which is for a blend, and that they have to work seven days a week and kind of kind of, and kind of rush through the process because of the demands from their corporate uh, corporate headquarters. And he said in the 16 years he's been there, they've had eight different marketing teams try to market their product. And, uh, you know, to date, it's still not where they probably want it to be. So it's, uh, it's you can tell it's a bit of a struggle for him. Yeah, I mean, that's his, that's his home. I oh, mean, yeah. that's his whole life. And now we're drinking whiskey that he laid down. I mean, a lot of yeah. times we meet distillers and blenders that we're not drinking anything that they touched yet. Yeah. And so we're drinking Gordon Bruce. Yeah, <laughs> we're drinking yeah exactly. his, um, his distillate. And that was kind of the joke. Um, I, to be honest, I wasn't very good with the valves. Mm -hmm. I always was playing the wrong valve, which is very dangerous in the yes. distillery. Uh, the valves are really difficult. Um, mm -hmm. You know, where you want that new make spirit or that um, pot ale to go or where. Yeah. <laughs> that's actually pretty important. But um, luckily, I didn't mess anything up. But I always said that if you, what was that? seven years ago now so if you get a bad and knock 12 it might be it'll be in a few years <laughs> yeah you have to uh keep an eye out for uh anox that were vintage the year you worked there so you can say i might have made this whiskey or helped make it yeah, at least. i don't know we'll uh, see <laughs> so i i did finish that uh pino uh tasmanian mm -hmm. one um it, that one was good that one for me needed a little bit of water to kind of tame it uh it, wasn't super complex for me, but it had that nice like berry sweetness to it that I, I enjoyed. So uh, all five of these pours were really excellent. So uh, again, thank you for the hundredth time for sending these along. Um, yeah, of course. Right. So I do have a hi, Hillary. I want to say hi to Hillary because oh, yeah. I adore and miss her. And uh, yeah, she's down in Miami. She she's from uh, my old Bacardi team, my right. old uh, yeah. doers portfolio. So I better get a text message from her after this. Well, speaking of Bacardi, what would you say the the your the highlight of working for Bacardi? Like, what was the what what do you miss most about working for Bacardi? Um, I mean, I we had a really great team. Hillary was actually part of that, and it was um yeah, it was just a really awesome group to work with here in North America. And mm -hmm. um, you know, I I wanted to see how I had worked retail before, as I had mentioned, and. I wanted to see what it was like to actually create and grow a brand. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, uh, slightly in between the the retail job um, as a buyer in Massachusetts, I tried to do some of my own importing on my yeah. own. Um, it, it requires a lot of capital, <laughs> as you can yeah. imagine. Um, and it... It's not that it didn't work out, but it just, you know, I, I had to kind of change direction. And But I knew that I wanted to try and build a brand, not necessarily from scratch, like making my own whiskey, but, um, you know, put together uh, the whole vision of, you know, how we're going to explain this and how we can get people excited about it. And, you know, and obviously, of course, with good liquid. Yeah. and. It was so fun. It's great for me to watch people just get so excited about something new. And so mm -hmm. um, that was actually an opportunity and why I joined um, that team. I was interviewing with some other bigger brands, but Aberfeldy was known, um, but we were also working to grow Kregalaki, Altmore, Royal Brockla, and the Devron, McDuff. Yeah. And Kregalaki at that time was one of the largest. Um, I have a pretty decent collection of Kregalaki. It had always been a favorite malt of mine. Mm -hmm. um, Altmore, I had a uh, joke that I had kind of uh, trespassed at that distillery. It doesn't allow visitors. So, I mean, I felt like it was almost meant to be. These were brands that I had tasted and knew that I really liked. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was able to potentially have uh, help them grow and help yeah. people find them. Um, and so it was, it was really great helping to, to build that throughout North America for those brands and those teams. And, you know, they're going to change and shift. I know that some of them probably won't stay in North America and maybe some of the work that I did will, will not, uh, will not stick, but, uh, it still was a really great opportunity to really try and grow, um, a fan some fantastic brands and get people exposed to them. 
Yeah, and that's awesome. And I'm sure a lot of that knowledge uh, transferred to First Fill Spirits and the, what you built up there. Yeah, no, for sure. We had uh, some Aberfeldy in here. I love their limited edition uh, finishes. And when an IB comes up of any of those, you better believe I'm grabbing them. So oh, yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. Absolutely. That's not really helping Bacardi, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, all right, uh, I'm. Uh, it's getting a little late, so I've got a few few last questions yeah. for you. Quick questions: sure. um, bourbon or scotch? Which are you picking? I, I'm going to say scotch because it will always be my first true love. Um, yeah. But I I'm so happy to be back in the bourbon world. Yeah, I missed it. I didn't think that I missed it working in Scotch, and then I came back and I was like, "Wow, sc bourbon is wild!" Like, yeah. and bourbon drinkers are wild, and I really missed them. <laughs> yeah, no, no, for sure. Um, uh, what was the? Uh, what's your favorite distillery? Do you have a favorite distillery? If you could just pick one. I mean, it, it has been Krigalaki for for oh. a long time. Um, I just I love the. The funk, and that's well before I um, moved or worked for the brand. Um, yeah. So it it has been uh, one of my one of my favorites, um, and I, I I always loved a knock too. Um, oh, that's tough. I don't. <laughs> it's so hard for for me to pick. I mean, you probably have had this too. Um, there's there's the category of the whiskey that I like to drink, you know, mm -hmm. and some of my favorite whiskeys. But then being fortunate enough to go to so many distilleries around the world, yeah. um, some 99% more than that, 99.5% of all of my experiences were amazing, you know, mm -hmm. and they, people were very welcoming, but there were some that actually were not very kind or pleasant and not, um, I don't know, maybe left a, a bad feeling yeah. after the visit. And um, you know, there's, there's a one or two of those where, you know, it falls into that category too. So it's experience with, with the brand and just love yeah. and then what I want to drink. So there's lots of different loves. Um, yeah. but I, Craig Alkey, you know, is what I just, um, that's what my palate craves typically mm -hmm. is that style. Yeah, and I, I think anybody who really loves whiskey understands the the whiskey can be so much more than the liquid itself. It's got a story behind yeah. it, has your experience behind it, who you drank it with, where it's from, and everything. So the experience you have at the distillery will have an impact on your per, uh, perception of it. Um, so the ones that you had a bad experience of, you want to out anybody, places we should avoid? Yeah. No? All right. Um, um, how many uh, bottles do you have in your personal collection? I haven't, and it's actually slowed down because now I actually have to use my money to buy bottles for this place. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. this is sort of part of the collection, but not really. I technically yeah. own it, but need someone else to buy it. Um, but in my personal, now I'm probably um, probably around like 400 bottles, All right. yeah. I would say. Um, yeah, and I'm, I also have, maybe you're this way too, but I have a really crazy amount of sample bottles going yeah. on yeah. um it's pretty out of control i actually created my fiance um i've created a monster he's a whiskey drinker now too and um we have a basket and it's of many one two ounce vials because it's yeah. getting so out of hand mm -hmm. and they're all labeled but i said new rules we're not drinking out of big bottles we're drinking out of the minis and you have to pull from the basket you can put it back once but you then can only pick a second time and you have to pick between the two. So yeah. I'm not, <laughs> we need to get through some of these. They're all great. We're going to enjoy yeah. them. We're going to talk about them, but we need to get through <laughs> some of these, these samples. Yeah, no, I definitely have that same issue. I've got tons of samples uh, hidden on, on my top shelf. And the challenge is always, I always have, a, I'm in the mood for one of my big bottles. So I never reach towards something <laughs> new for my sample. So that that's a good rule though. I like that at least like every night you have to have at least one sample bottle just to get it out of the way. And it sounds like you've, you've converted your fiance from a non whiskey drinker to a whiskey drinker. I mean, he, he, I think he liked whiskey, but, um, I, I created a scotch snob. You know, okay. Like well, so. so the hardest convert that I've ever had is my wife. Uh, she doesn't hate it outright. She doesn't necessarily dislike it, but she doesn't 
seek it out. So when you do go down the city, I, I need your help to try to push her over the edge yes. to get back into the uh, the whiskey tasting world. So she'll Let's be do it. she'll she'll be. Has uh, she the, yeah. been to? Have you brought her to Scotland? Uh, no. So I I uh, well yes actually let me uh, we went to Scotland five years ago or six years ago, I think it was, five, six years ago. Uh, but that was before I got into whiskey, so we didn't do any of the whiskey stuff out there. It was all hiking and cuisine and that kind of stuff. So, And that's my, my wife down there, V-Fish. She's uh, saying she's down. So uh, next time you're in the city, we can meet at Copper and Oak or one of the other whiskey shops, uh, whiskey store, uh, bars, and uh, we can try to convince her. You know, you can, you can try to convince her to enjoy whiskey better than I have been able to. Yes, we'll do it. And I'm telling you, it's... um. Find a, a couple that that she's enjoying, and then bring her to the distillery. And in the Highlands, I mean, oh my gosh! And bring her yeah. to the Doorknock Hotel up north of Inverness. Like you, if you don't like it, then then yeah. you just don't like it. Yeah, you'll that's never... okay. You'll save a bunch of money, so it's okay. <laughs> yeah, but... actually, I, uh, I was just talking to her. Uh, Springbank just released a new experience where you can spend three nights in their still house and do like a very extensive. <laughs> spring back experience and i'm like i was talking to her i was like hey do you uh are you interested at the the week of my birthday they have an opening so you know but spring bank might not be for her spring bank's a little out there you know i mean i know that you love it but you might have to twist your arm go up to inverness yeah i think uh we'll have to stop at a second to story one that she really likes i know she She's actually mentioned, and this is would be convenient uh, uh, ge- geographically, uh, that she there's some errands that she liked. So yeah, start. and oh. great hiking there. Oh my oh, goodness! Yeah. So that so, could so. be a, a two like a Campbelltown errand, and uh, that could be the mm-hmm. the convincing trip. So I'll have to I'll keep you posted on that. But first, we'll get her down to to uh, Copper and Oak and try to get her to drink some of that whiskey. All right, I'm gonna get you out of here on this final question. Okay. If you were going to share a dram of whiskey with four famous people, who are you going to drink it with? Four? Four. Huh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Do De- I even they can be dead or alive. Dead or alive. Oh, geez. Um, I'm not great with, uh, I guess it doesn't have to be pop, pop it culture. Doesn't have to be. <laughs> it doesn't have to be at all. Um, wow, you really got me with this one. Who's famous that I would want to, um, oh my goodness. I can't, you, you caught me so off guard. If you need to. I have, to, what if I can think of one? Okay. Um, uh, yeah. you, you can one, the I need to phone three. a friend, maybe Eric. I mean, <laughs> I'll have to call my fiance and be like, who do I, um, uh, famous people. You know, I I know this is um, like a little bit touche, but I would love, and I follow her, and I feel like we are friends, but we totally are not. And but I would, and she's in whiskey, but it just comes up. But I would love to just have a drink with Rachel Berry. <laughs> I just I think I I love, and I want to have that drink at Glen Glassa on the yeah. beach behind the distillery. So maybe we can make that happen. But I would not at Glen Dronic. I love Glen Dronic, but I want. Glen Glassa, um, Evolution at Natural Cast Strength because mm-hmm. you can do that. Yeah, She's very right very, and yeah. I that's what I want to drink at the beach in Port Soy. So right. that's like my maybe she'll <laughs> maybe she'll call me up. We're Facebook friends, but that means nothing these days. Um, yeah, well, it's better than nothing. Now you just get ever you know become friends on the various social media platforms. Eventually, you'll grab that connection. Yes. So. And um, I was sticking to whiskey, Michael Jackson, too. If anyone's yeah, had his books, that was the first book that I ever bought for myself, and it was a big deal. And I would bring that huge, it was whiskey, his, you know, just said whiskey on it. I would bring that book to whiskey bars. I mean, yeah. I was obnoxious. And I would take it on planes and just have this massive hardcover book and, like, yeah. be highlighting it. Um, I mean, just an amazing uh, reference. Uh, it's actually in the shop now. So, I mean, it would be really cool to, to go back and, and be able to meet him. Um, oh, it sounds like I don't do anything but whiskey. Um, <laughs> no, no, I mean, those are great answers. I mean, you, you can't go wrong with people in the whiskey industry. They're going to understand and appreciate the uh, drams better anyway. So th- those are go- both good answers. And you don't have to, if you don't know other two other people, that's fine. You can just, I mean, I know other famous people, but I don't know if I want to drink with them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you have to make sure. Yeah, right. So, well, I failed on that question. Thanks, Tim. 
<laughs> no, no, no. There's no, there's no failing. This is all, uh, all for fun. Um, but uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to join me tonight. Uh, and this was a lot of fun. Next time you and your fiance are in the new, in New York City, let us know. We can definitely try to meet you down there. I mean, you drive right by where we live. We live in Austin, in New York, so it's along the way yeah. down to from Saratoga Springs to New York City. Keep us posted on that, and we'll we'll definitely meet up and uh, share some drams in person. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah. It was it was great to catch up, and I know we'll see each other soon. So yeah, absolutely. Um, ha I, I hope you have a good night. And again, thank you for these drams. Yeah, sure thing. All right. Talk All right. Later. Cheers. Bye. Bye.